Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are giving just uh, 30 seconds for people to join us in the room, and we will begin shortly after that. Okay, hello. Can everyone hear me properly? Great. Hello, my name is uh, Carol Abiranem. Thank you for joining us today in this uh, lovely webinar that's also very dear to my heart. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be discussing mental and psychological impairments. How do they fall through the cracks of Arab social protection systems if they do so? Um, I will only speak very briefly at the beginning, and then I will introduce to our fellow speakers and panelists, Dr. Brigitte Khouri, Dr. Rachel Forrester-Jones, and uh, Dr. or Mr. Ahmed uh, Burkia. I will give a brief introduction um, of each of the speakers before they speak, uh, and each panelist will be given uh, five to ten minutes maximum uh, to, to speak. I will flag you down two minutes prior uh, before your time runs out. Um, today, we're going to be talking about mental and psychological health, which are often in the MENA region and the North African region overlooked or very timidly approached, um, either as a day-to-day -day social conversation because of the taboo around it, or uh, overlooked in, in social policies and in social services, or just really briefly touched upon as main components that have to be uh, present in any sort of uh, coverage system. And we saw in, during the COVID pandemic uh, that there was an increase of talking about psychological and uh, mental impairments. Uh, there was a need for people to discuss this. We saw few efforts of actually untangling this issue. Um, but if you ask me, I think there, it's very limited, the efforts on, on including people with uh, very specific needs and uh, with such impairments, including them in in the larger coverage system of social services, of social protection, of employment and economic rights, and increasing the access to justice, uh, uh, ser just services, sorry, for these individuals. Um, I will not talk more about this. I will leave it up to the panelists to actually open up the floor for the discussion. Uh, I would like to also uh, tell everyone uh, and thank also the Arab Reform Initiative uh, as this or this webinar is co-hosted by Arab Reform Initiative or ARI and the Arab Forum for the Rights of People with Disability, AFRPD. And this is done within the framework of ARI's social protection program and the Arab Region Hub for Social Protection, which it hosts and coordinates. This is the 10th uh, webinar in our series. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> we will take comments from the public and uh, questions from the public at the very end of the three presentations. Uh, please make sure to write your comments in the uh, in the comment box, and I will be sure to um, to, uh, to to say the, to to ask them uh, at the very end. We have sign language and interpretation from Arabic to English and English to Arabic uh, present. If you feel that there's any technical problems, uh, please make sure to write them also in the comment box, and we will address them. Uh, thank you so much. We will start with Dr. Brigitte Khouri, uh, a small brief introduction about Dr. Khouri among the many roles that she has. She is the professor and vice chair of psychology at the Department of Psychiatry of the American University of Beirut, Faculty of Medicine. She is also the director of the Clinical Psychology Training Program and the director of the Arab Regional Center for Research and Training in Mental Health. Dr. Khouri, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we would like you to tackle a couple of questions, if you can. Uh, first of, what is the status quo of mental and psychological health in the Arab region? How might it have regressed with the COVID-19 pandemic and other overlapping or competing crises? Here, we're also trying to look at the effects of um, the earthquakes, for example, the recent earthquakes that we have been witnessing in the regions. Uh, what are these specific? What are these the people's specific needs? If we have to be inclusive of their needs, and who is stepping in? to cater to them in the absence of serious state efforts. 
Great, thank I you, Carol. To you. <laughs> thank you, Carol, for the lovely introduction, and thank you for uh, the hosts for putting together this webinar. I'm I'm very happy to participate, and an honor to be with my esteemed panelists. Um, Andrew, can you share the slides? I have a few slides that will guide the discussion a bit. Okay, thank you. We can skip that one. <laughs> So the two questions that Carol asked me are these two. What's the status quo of mental health and psychological health in the region? How did it regress with COVID-19 and other overlapping compounding or competing crises? I will, ad I will address this question and then move to the next one. Um, next. Okay, just, just to put things in perspective, uh, there, it's estimated that we have around 11% of the global population that lives with some form of mental health disorder. So this is globally, but on an, on an Arab level, on a regional level, it is estimated that we have 30% of populations from all Arab countries who suffer from a psychiatric problem. Of course, there are higher proportions in countries where there are uh, more problems and more violence and uh, uh, they face uh, more distressing uh, context that, to live in, like in Iraq, Iraqis, Palestinians, and I, I said possibly the Lebanese because we don't have really any data yet, but from what I have seen around me and what I see in the clinic, I think we definitely have a higher proportion than other countries in the region. And the most common disorders found are depression, anxiety, which are common everywhere, but we have trauma to be an additional common disorder now that happens in our region. Next, please. So what are the main challenges? So stigma is really the first challenge and the public perception of what mental illness is, which is considered still something unknown, something scary, something to be tackled with under the table in secrecy, not to um, you know, claim that somebody has it or is seeking help. Uh, there's a lot of discrimination towards people with mental health problems. There's prejudice and sometimes even fear and avoidance. Until now, I have people in the clinic who come and say, no one knows that I'm here. I don't want my family to know I'm here. Some people ask if we have a back door so they don't have to come through the waiting room. So there is still, although people seek help, but there is still some stigma associated with it. Accessibility and affordability are the two main challenges that I think we have in our region. So accessibility to care. Most of the care is focused in, um, urban areas and cities and unfortunately sometimes it's very difficult for people who live outside the cities to access care in addition we have most of the mental health professionals who also live in um, urban areas so accessibility whether to care or to mental health professionals is reduced for people who live outside the cities affordability is another problem uh, some countries some insurances do cover mental health services. Most of the countries don't. In Lebanon, it doesn't. And unfortunately, people have to pay out of pocket to a service that is sometimes quite expensive and seen, unfortunately, as a luxury. So affordability to the care and affordability to even access the care is uh, sometimes prohibitive, prohibitive for people to access it. Of course, in general, in most of the regions, there is a lack of mental health policy and strategy. Um, mental health is the least uh, important problem for governments, even for health ministries. Usually for, uh, within the budget of a health ministry, the mental health budget is between one to 4%. So it's really very low. Um, this is why, uh, you know, the governments don't think it's really a burden, although it is a big burden of disease, as we all know. So there is usually not a vision of what mental health policy can be, what the strategy can be, how to improve services, how to roll out the services, which of course is a main challenge to, to the citizens. And of course, unfortunately, our region has witnessed wars, violence, financial hardships, displacement, a large number of refugees, discrimination, gender inequality, poverty, more recently, natural disasters like earthquakes, so all these problems and disasters, of course, lead most of the time to mental health problems and therefore the needs are much more higher than other regions in the world. Next, please. Then COVID-19 happened. 
And uh, early in COVID-19, the president of the American Psychological Association back then, Dr. Sandra Schulman, said that after COVID-19, there will be a mental health pandemic, which was already predicted. And surely enough, we have that, we hit that, and we're still trying to go, to go through it. Um, many reasons for this. The youth especially were impacted through their education, which suddenly became all online. The social life extremely reduced, if non-existent, which led to, of course, an impact on their emotional growth and, of course, cognitive growth. So all these problems have led to a generation of young people, which is highly anxious, highly fearful, down, depressed. Um, two years of their life, and of course, they were teenage years, that's even more impactful because these were the growing years. And uh, even for the, the kids themselves, younger kids were also impacted. There are children who didn't go to school until they were age five for the first time they stopped in school when the first two years were all online. And I heard from our school, from our school where my kids go, the director said, the kids came into school, they don't even know how to be in school. They don't know how to listen to the bell, stand in line, listen to the teacher. So it was really delaying growing on so many levels. Of course, it led to loss of jobs, loss of work, isolation, all these problems that led to an increase of mental health problems. Yet when COVID-19 decreased or ended or is ending, we are forced to have an appearance of normalcy, which actually happened to be very difficult because after two years of abnormal living conditions, going back to normalcy has been quite challenging. We see a lot less social gatherings, a lot less socializing, actually. Um, and of course, many, many other things that change that also do impact the mental health. The only favorable outcome that I could think of is that telemental health development increase. So because of COVID, we were forced to turn into telemental health, which in a way allowed to more accessibility for some regions within a country and within the region. So this was one of the um, positive favorable outcomes that we had from COVID. Next, please. Next. So the second question that I'm going to tackle is what are people's specific needs and who is stepping in to cater to them in the absence of very, very few, very little state efforts? So what are the needs of our population? Awareness and advocacy around mental health in order to decrease the stigma is quite important. Um, and this is usually done by professionals, of course, by NGOs, by media. Media has a very big role to play and social media especially. Of course, having coverage of mental health services by national and or private insurances. This will, of course, allow to decrease, increase the affordability of care and the accessibility. So very important to have that also recognize that mental health is one of the big problems and one of the big missions that ministries and governments need to address. One of the ways in the absence, unfortunately, of enough mental health professionals is the integration of mental health in primary care. So training primary care physicians into mental health services would decrease a bit the burden of, on, on the professionals that are uh, fulfilling the services and will help in offering services to the people who need it. As I said, NGOs are stepping in, professional associations are stepping in. We also need to include as part of awareness and advocacy and as part of people speaking about their own needs are the actual service users meaning the people who use the services need to speak about it, about themselves, their needs, what uh, the challenges they face and how uh, their life is impacted and how it can be better. So the service users and their families, and this is an area where we really lag in the Arab region, to give them the platform to be able to speak about, uh, about their suffering and about their challenges. And I just want to end by saying no one can really replace government efforts on a national level. Uh, NGOs try, the professionals try, but when we really want uh, a blanket effort on mental health in any country, governments have to step in and have a proper policy to roll these uh, services out. 
I think I am done if I can last. Yes, this is it. Thank you so much. I will leave it to my panelists to continue the discussion. This is my email if anyone would like to be in touch with me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Khoury, for this uh, for this wonderful introduction to the topic and, and eye-opening information. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the emerging um, themes or topics, if you'd like, in, in mental health during COVID. I remember there was a time where there was a debate about calling it isolation or social distancing and how that was triggering for, for the fact that we are normalizing a certain uh, unhealthy psychological environment for most young people. And so that name change in itself kind of took into consideration how, how impactful uh, suddenly having a surge of talking about mental health also um, was, was heavy for a lot of people, right? So it was a taboo, Absolutely. it still is a taboo. Um, but I also, I feel one of the most positive things that came about is that this forced the conversation. It forced everyone to understand that no one is um, free or liberated from potential psychological or mental difficulties, challenges, or even just momentary challenges or impairments sometimes. And that kind of normalized how prevalent this is. And I think it raised awareness to, to how it can affect people in different shapes, sizes, and, um, and environments as well. Absolutely. Uh, I... And and we see this, just the last point, we see this in the number of people who ask for our services and the long wait lists exactly. that exist everywhere in the world. Exactly. But here's particularly people wait for six months, sometimes yeah. a year to access service. So yeah. yeah, which also shows the urgency and the needs of the specific Absolutely. community that you know, uh, we used to talk about mental health services as being a luxury, right? That if you are able to have the basic needs, then you can afford that. Now we are trying to see how it can be a basic service because people really need it. Um, I will I will move on to our next panelist. Uh, we have a we have a question later for you, Dr. Khoury. Uh, we will mention that in the Q and A section at the very end. I will move on now to Dr. Ahmed Berkia. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, مش حال الترجمة ولا بعد؟ Okay. Uh, بس إذا بتشيل الميوت عن الميكروفون لح لح أحكي بالعربي هلا بس مشان uh, مشان تقدر أنت تستلم الساحة. بس إذا بتشيل الم... أيوة نح... مرحبا دكتور دكتور أحمد فدكتور أحمد لح أعطي مختصر صغير عن عنك ولح أرجع أطرح الأسئلة بال بالعربي دكتور أحمد is the secretary general of the Arab Forum for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities who are co-organizing this uh, webinar he is a trainer in training engineering <clears throat> international human rights mechanism monitoring mechanisms networking techniques and advocacy and disability rights he is also a civil society actor engaged in the protection and promotion of disability rights and dr ahmad will be providing us with a more uh, uh, deeper focus on civil society and uh, the protection and promotion of people uh, with disabilities or people that may be uh, dealing with uh, mental impairments. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ahmad, uh, we want to ask you a question. How do you think about the health care and social security in the area of protection and protection of people with disabilities and mental health? وهل في اسباب سياسيه واقتصاديه او سياسيه اقتصاديه وراء استبعاد وتهميش هدول الاشخاص يلي عم بيعانوا من من هول الامبيرمنتس انا اسف اذا ترجمات الكلمات يمكن ما لما تكون صح بالمحلات بس عم جرب ترجم بسرعه هلا اوكي اولا مرحبا بكم وشكرا على استضافتي للمشاركه في هذا اللقاء الذي يتحدث حول موضوع أصبح يحظى بأهمية بالغة خاصة في العصر الحديث فموضوع فربما أول سؤال هو لماذا الاهتمام بالإعاقة النفسية الآن هناك العديد من العوامل التي تدعو إلى الاهتمام بالإعاقة النفسية والعقلية الآن منها ربما مؤشرات الصحة النفسية في تدني مستمر ثم أيضا هناك الضغوط والاضطرابات التي أصبحت هي سمة العصر ثم كذلك لا ننسى أنه كما أشارت الدكتورة سابقا 
بعد الجائحة العالمية كوفيد-19 أقبل الناس على استخدام الأدوية نفسانية الأدوية نفسانية التأثير ثم أيضا ظروف العمل والبطالة والهشاشة والفقر كلها عوامل تزيد من انتشار الإعاقة الخفيفة الغير المرئية ربما نقطة أخرى أو مؤشر آخر هو الحيف الذي يطال الأشخاص في وضعية إعاقة نفسية من فقدان العمل من الوصمة الاجتماعية التي لا زالت تطال الإعاقة النفسية ضعف نظام التشخيص والتقييم والتتبع النقص الكبير في الكوادر الطبية المدربة بشكل عام هنا أتحدث عن الدول العالم العربي ليس كلهم طبعا ولكن الغالبية العظمى فيهم هذا المفهوم هو يعني بالنسبة لدول شمال أفريقيا يعتقدون أن هذا المفهوم ظهر لأول مرة في فرنسا سنة 2005 خاصة في القانون الخاص بالمساواة في الحقوق والفرص والمشاركة والمواطنة للأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة ويشير إلى السبب النفسي المحتمل للإعاقة فهنا أيضا مفروض أن نحدد ما المقصود بالإعاقة النفسية هناك بعض النقاط التي ربما سنحدد بها أو على الأقل نتعرف بها من خلالها على ما المقصود بالإعاقة النفسية يجسد هذا المفهوم محاولات التقريب بين سياسات الرعاية الصحية وسياسات العمل الاجتماعي ثانيا أن ارتباط هذا المفهوم في بداياته بمصطلح المرض النفسي لكن يمكن توسيعه ليشمل شريحة واسعة من السكان الذين هم في حالة إعاقة ذات أصل نفسي دون معاناة من مرض عقلي ولقد تم بناء فكرة الإعاقة النفسية دون أساس طبي أنوسي فإذا كان القانون 2005 ينص على أن أصل الإعاقة يمكن أن يكون نفسيا فإنه لا يحدد الفروق بين الإعاقة العقلية والإعاقة النفسية والإعاقة المعرفية ومن خلال سرد الأصول المحتملة للإعاقة فإن الإعاقة النفسية هي التي لا تكون جسدية أو عقلية أو غير ذلك وعلى كل حال فيستخدم مصطلح الاضطرابات النفسية للإشارة إلى مجموعة من الاضطرابات النفسية والسلوكية التي تندرج ضمن التصنيف الإحصائي الدولي للأمراض والمشاكل الصحية وتشمل هذه المجموعة من الاضطرابات تلك التي تتسبب في ارتفاع المرض مثل الاكتئاب والاضطراب المزاجي ثنائي القطب والفصام واضطرابات القلق والخوف واضطرابات تعاطي المواد وحالة العجز الذهني واضطرابات النمو والسلوك التي عادة ما تظهر بوادرها في مرحلة الطفورة والمراهقة بما في ذلك التوحد عادة تم إجراء وهناك دراسة تم إجراءها للتعرف على الصعوبات التي يواجهها الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة بسبب الاضطرابات النفسية كشفت أن إعاقات غير المرئية لا تزال غير معروفة في إلى حد كبير وأن التمثل الثابت للإعاقة هو الإعاقة الجسدية والإعاقة الحسية والإعاقة الذهنية ونتيجة لذلك تظل الإعاقات غير المرئية غير معروفة إلى حد كبير وهذا أيضا من المشاكل التي تعقد الأمور في هذا المجال فما الفرق بين الاضطرابات النفسية والأمراض الأخرى؟ الاضطراب النفسي يؤثر على الشخصية ككل وليس فقط على جزء من الشخص يتم تحديد أسباب الإعاقة النفسية في تنوعها أي الاضطرابات الاكتئابية الشديدة والحالة الدهانية والتدهور العقلي المرتبط بالأمر إلى غير ذلك وفي الحقيقة إن مصطلح الإعاقة النفسية يخفي مجموعة متنوعة من المواقف والصعوبات الخاصة في الاندماج الاجتماعي للأشخاص ومع ذلك غالبا ما يتفق الأقارب والمهنيون على أن الشخص يعاني من إعاقة عقلية إذا ما هي العلامات السريرية للإعاقة النفسية ربما أشارت إليها الأستاذة سابقة الدكتورة سابقا ولكن يمكن الوقوف على ثلاث علامات وهي علامة يمكن هي التسويف والبراغماتية والبطالة 
ويمكن ان تؤدي هذه الشر هذه العلامات الثلاث الى الخمول والعزله في والعزله عن المحيط لكن اذا عدنا الى الاحصائيات فانا غير متخصص في التقنيات وفي الجانب العلمي ل الإعاقة النفسية ولكن أريد أن أتناولها كيف من خلال السياسات ومن خلال كحق من حقوق الإنسان للأشخاص الذين يعانون من الإعاقة النفسية والعقلية فحسب الإحصاءات العالمية فربع سكان العالم يصابون بمرض نفسي في حالة في مرحلة ما من حياتهم تتسبب الأمراض النفسية في حدود عدد كبير من الوفيات وحالة العجز وهي تمثل 8.8% و16.6% من عبء المرض الإجمالي الناجم عن الاعتلالات الصحية بالبلدان المنخفضة الدخل والمتوسط الدخل التوالي يمثل الاكتئاب ثاني أهم أسباب عبء المرض في البلدان المتوسطة الدخل وثالث أهم تلك الأسباب في البلدان المنخفضة الدخل في عام 2030 ويتضرر 10% تقريبا من سكان العالم من الاضطرابات النفسيه التي تمثل 30% من العبء العالمي للامراض الغير المميته ثم حوالي 20% من الاطفال المراهقين في العالم لديهم اضطرابات او مشاكل نفسيه فاذا اضفنا الى هذه العوا... الى هذه الاحصائيات في العالم العربي سنجد أن المشاكل التي تتخبط فيها دول العالم العربي من أزمات اقتصادية وسياسية واجتماعية ونزاعات وحروب أهلية بالإضافة إلى هيمنة الفكر الغيبي في التعاطي مع, موضوع مع هذا الموضوع وأيضا ارتفاع نسبة الأمية وعدم الثقة في العلم تشكل لا محالة عوامل ضافية في ارتفاع نسبة انتشار الإعاقة النفسية والعقلية في هذه البلدان وبناء على ما تقدم من معطيات يتبين أن الصحة العقلية أصبحت تشكل أحد أبرز مشاكل الصحة العامة وبالتالي يجب أن تحظى بالاهتمام اللازم في السياسات العمومية باعتبارها مكونا أساسيا لراحة ورفاهية المواطنين بالإضافة إلى ضرورة مراجعة القوانين المنظمة للصحة النفسية والعقلية وتحسين جودة التكفل بالمرضى وتوفير العلاجات المتخصصة الموجهة لفئات الأطفال والمراهقين والمسنين دكتور أحمد عنا بعد دقيقة بس لل... آه. ل... لنختم الجولة إذا, بت... إذا بتقلنا إذا هل في سبب أو كم سبب ممكن تفكر فيهم ليش هيدي الفئة من المجتمع عادة بيتم استبعادها من هيك سياسات ب... بحسب خبرتك أوكي أعتقد بأنه على الرغم من كون العديد من الدول أنها صدقت على الاتفاقية الدولية لحقوق الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة والتي تنص على ضرورة إلى الأهمية اللازمة للإعاقة الذهنية والإعاقة النفسية والعقلية فقامت العديد من الدول يعني امتثالا لهذه الاتفاقية من اتخاذ العديد من الإجراءات على مستوى مثلا تعديل القوانين بما يتلائم مع هذه الاتفاقية لكن بقي نقطة واحدة هي أنه محل خلاف بين هذه الدول خصوصا الدول المتدينة أو المحافظة التي ترفض إلى حد ما أن تحسم في مسألة الأهلية القانونية خاصة أهلية الأداء فيما يتعلق بالنسبة للأشخاص المصابين الذين يعانون من الإعاقة النفسية ولكن مع ذلك نجد هناك أوراش مفتوحة حاليا ونقاش مفتوح خاصة في الأوساط الحقوقية من أجل من أجل يعني جعل المنظومة الحماية الاجتماعية تتبنى أو تتضمن الإشارة إلى إلى الأهمية اللازمة من اتخاذ تدابير وإجراءات لتمكين الأشخاص الذين يعانون من إعاقة نفسية بالحقوق على قدم المساواة مع غيرهم من المواطنين نعم 
اوكي شكرا كثير دكتور احمد رح نرجع هلا رح نرجع لك هلا بسؤال بس كان بدي اوضح شغله القانون اللي حكيت عنه هو كان ب 2005 ولا 2019 بشيل الميوت بس عفوا عفوا دكتور احمد نعم انا قلت يعني الاتفاقيه الدوليه هي الاتفاقيه التي تم اعتمادها من طرف الامم المتحده في 2006 و تفاوتت الدول تفاوتت الدول العربيه في المصادقه عليها ما بين 2008 الى يومنا هذا وبلغت من ضمنها اخر دوله عربيه صدقت على الاتفاقيه هي لبنان مؤخرا في السنه الماضيه اعتقد اوكي اوكي شكرا دكتور احمد بنرجع آه بنرجع لك هلا بجلسه الاسئله والاجوبه آه بسؤال رح <تصفيق> ننتقل we're gonna move to um, to our final panelist uh, Dr. Rachel Forrester Jones Uh, who is with us uh, right now. Uh, uh, she is the, I will also be very brief with the introduction. She's director and professor of the School of Health uh, Studies at Western University uh, in Canada, Ontario, right? Uh, she joined West, uh, she joined uh, Western from the University of Bath in the UK, where she was a professor of social policy, head of the Department of Social and Policy Sciences, and the director of the Center for Analysis uh, Uh, of the for, oh, sorry for the analysis of That's social fine. policies. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Forrester Jones. So our question is more uh, to you is more uh, is broader. Uh, we want to try to try to get some uh, real life examples and best practices, or maybe lessons that we could share. Uh, but we we wanted to 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 ask the question about. Um, social protection coverage for for the for the respected communities so what are some feasible solutions that we can talk to talk about to achieve universal health and social protection coverage for people um, that are dealing with psychological and mental um, impairments and uh, and you know what could actually work because with the attempt of trying to find a social protection uh, mechanism or policy for people we see here at least in Lebanon that Um, everyone is just sh chanting universal health coverage, universal health coverage. Well, our universal, well, our health coverage kind of fell apart. So, and that was on uh, what is internationally not debatable, which is, you know, uh, medical and physical uh, uh, needs. So hospitals mainly, um, but, but that fell apart. And so if we talk about coverage uh, and inclusion of these individuals in social and health policies, particular, uh, how can we how can we learn from the examples and what kind of solutions can we offer practically? Okay, thank you so much. And um, hello, everybody from Canada. Uh, and it's currently 9.05 here. I'm very honored to be with you. Uh, I wonder if you could um, share my slides, please. Thank you so much. Um, yes, well, I've been asked to uh, share good stories from the rest of the world, uh, and I begin with a disclaimer. Uh, if we look to other countries for solutions, we're not necessarily going to find them. Europe comprises the most equal societies in the world, has the highest working conditions, and provides general social protection. Yet in 2017, Europe set out the European pillar of social rights for a fair, inclusive Europe, because the region has yet to provide full equity and equality for people with disabilities, including those with mental and psychological impairments. However, uh, in my sort of uh, research over the last 30 years in this area, there are some common themes I think that we can avoid to, um, to consider, uh, there's common themes that we can consider uh, to avoid historical mistakes made in other countries. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the main international declarations and treaties relevant to the care and support of people with all disabilities. All of these treaties, covenants and conventions advocate that all countries and states should progressively realize or actively make a plan. And that's my first theme, progressively realization of social protection means making a plan. 
to provide social protection that is equitable. Now, uh, some of these, uh, the declarations here, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights is just that, a declaration. Uh, it's not enshrined in international law, but the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is a treaty and is a law. Um, very happy to say that, yes, indeed, uh, Le Lebanon, uh, like the rest of the Arab countries, signed up to and ratified the United Nations Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities only last month. And all of these link into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, all of these, uh, um, all, all of these uh, declarations and treaties uh, encapsulate the following. Firstly, that people with disabilities should be viewed and understood through the lens of the social model rather than the medical model that shows the social model shows how society disables people who simply need care and support to participate in society. And this is the campaign that needs to be put forward, that people simply are, are equal to everybody else. They just need support uh, to participate in society. And secondly, that each country should strive to provide services that enable people to exercise their economic, social and cultural rights, as well as their legal and political rights to participate in society. This makes perfect sense because, for example, if you, uh, you are less likely to suffer if you have a legal and political right to call on the government to, to ask them not to make you suffer or to uh, leave you to suffer. Slide three, please. OK, but who is going to provide social protection? Well, I'm using uh, the model of social support here and social networks. And this has been a, a, a lot of work around the world on this, again, uh, for time immemorial. The provider should not be one person. The provider should not be one family. Families need help too. So the provider of social support uh, and, and healthcare provision cannot just be the state on itself. The model of social support displayed here shows the optimum provision of social support. Firstly, semi-formal support people who have no connection with mental health services. It, for example, NGOs, INGOs, charities, religious groups, advocacy, self-advocacy groups, all very important. Informal support from peers and family. And formal support, yes, from professionals, including, including clinical psycho and educational psychologists, healthcare providers and social workers. Now, all of these groups should work together because each group brings something different. If one group is unavailable and something happens uh, because of uh, some issue or some scenario, then another group can take over and care and support, avoiding individuals falling through the cracks. Now, the problem that we have for people with uh, intellectual, uh, well, intellectual and developmental disabilities and psychological and mental health problems is that their social networks are very, very small. And a lot of the research has shown and all the studies that I've been involved with has shown that on average, whereas a person without that disability has a social network of around 150 people, excluding Facebook, uh, Facebook and social media, um, a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities will have a social network of just 23 people and a person with mental health problems will have a social network of just 22. So you can see there is a deficit there in terms of social support. So we need models to work with models of social support. Slide four, please. So this is uh, theme three, and this takes a, site, a life cycle approach to the care and social protection of people with mental health uh, difficulties and psychological problems using principles of normalization, so people should experience the normal rhythms of each day like any of us do, getting up in the morning, going to work uh, or, or doing some meaningful activities and enjoying life and doing uh, hobbies, etc. Social role, role valorization, that every person should, be, should have the dignity and a role that is, valor, uh, that is valued. And from a capability model, not from a deficit model, what these people cannot do, but from a capability model. This life cycle approach using principle, these principles um, uh, really helps us to think about uh, mental health through the life course. So if you look at um, this diagram, in the middle there you see a vulnerable person. And starting at the top in yellow, you see early interventions. 
Now, early interventions are very important because they can help a child who might be developing, for example, a mental health problem or autism or both. And let's not forget the intersectionality of all of these disabilities. Somebody can have a physical disability, a mental health disability and autism or and um, Down syndrome and, and, and so on and so forth. For each key stage of a person's life, as you go around this diagram, you can see that there are a number of possible interventions and supports that can help individuals move through that stage of life, avoiding difficulties for themselves and for their families. And ultimately, if they get that type of support, they will make less demands on state and the public purse. For example, at the bottom of the diagram, you see a brown bubble with the word transition. Transitional support is very important for youth moving from school to employment. If we do not have that transitional support, then those, those youth will fall through the cracks and that um, there's a knock-on effect from that. Slide five, please. So what kind of plan would we have across the life course? Well, Carol, you talked about universalist or so-called beverage models of welfare. Within that kind of model, healthcare is paid out of taxation and is free at the point of use. But funding of adult social care, which is very often what people with mental health difficulties need the most, because the research has also shown that if you have a mental health problem, if you have the right social support, you can actually function rather well in society. So um, funding of adult social care varies across the world. In Europe, it's centrally funded in half of the EU states. And in the other half, there's a sharing funding responsibility between central and regional or local levels. And that's where local authorities generate income from local government revenue, such as car parking charges. There is no national budget for social care, but arguably social care is just as important as health care. So within, I'm giving you one model here, which is the UK Care Act of 2014, involved in care planning that is reviewed yearly. And this is the kind of experience that somebody would or should have um, when they go through this process. So an individual appears to be in need of care and support. The local authority under this Care Act have a legal duty to carry out an assessment to see if that person is eligible uh, to be in need of state support. There is an eligibility criteria, and if they meet that eligibility criteria, then there is uh, a, an assessment, a financial assessment, to see how much they may have to pay. Now, before that, there may be, it may be information advice from local services, and that can be given as advice and the cost uh, of that advice too. Or there may also be free services, and because a mental health uh, somebody with a mental health person comes under the National Health Service, then that uh, that kind of psychological, um, clinical psychological um, assessment and uh, treatment is free. But the social care is not necessarily fit free. If somebody that social care across the life course will be capped currently uh, at eight to six thousand pounds over the lifetime. Now, if somebody can afford uh, to pay for their own care, the individual uh, arranges their own care and they pay. If they cannot, then care and support is provided and organised by the local authority and a personal budget or direct payments to the individual are uh, provided so that they can choose. So you see here that they are very much um, part, of the, part of the discussion here. They are very much part of um, uh, the, the stakeholders. And with the assessment, the family is involved, friends, friends uh, and other support, and, and maybe charitable organisations too, are all support uh, part and parcel of this assessment. Vulnerable adults uh, will also attract a range of cash payments, including uh, personal independence payment, disability allowance and attendance um, allowance, depending on their eligibility. Community-based um, care, social care, whether it be in family or residential homes, is arranged by local authorities, private organisations and families. And personalised care plans that are developed with the individual, the family and professionals are now generally used across Europe uh, and in Canada, promising more independent choice and a conduit to community social inclusion. 
uh, I think sometimes people think that, um, you know, residential care and uh, everyone in across Europe is living in, in uh, small houses uh, and living on their own in flats. It's not quite like that. Um, about two thirds of adults, for example, with intellectual and developmental disabilities are now living with their families uh, in England. So um, this is one kind of model. Each under this act, everyone should have an assessment based on the things they need in order to maximize their well-being. So for example, their social well-being, so that they are not lonely, their economic well-being, so that they have enough money to live a comfortable life, or the suitability of their accommodation. Does it help their well-being, or do they need to live somewhere else? As I said, local authorities are supposed to carry out an assessment. The local authority has then to provide services that meet those needs, so long as those needs meet the minimum standard. Yeah. Okay. Slide yeah, six. One minute to uh, yeah. two, two minutes maximum to. Okay. Up, okay. Similarly, carers, including family members, should have a carers assessment and get their needs met because, as we know, caring for someone can impact on the well-being of a carer, and this is meant to be a fairer way of providing care. But if people do not meet the new standard, for example, if they're quite independent and they only have a few needs, they will have to fund their own um, care. Um, slide seven, please. Get on to the last slide. How can any plan be instigated? Uh, well, I would say that the final theme is that uh, it needs to be developed and maintained and how it's developed and maintained is key. We have a growing society. There is a need for increased health and social care needs and costs for people with all kinds of disabilities who are getting older. There's a need for integration between organizations and professionals. That's not always easy and that needs to be talked about. Plans take time. Western countries started rights-based social protection in the 18th century. It's, not, it's still not good now. We need a clear visionary law that defines the critical aspects of uh, care for psychological supports and leaves room for local flexibility. And I would say avoid, keep changing legislation, having legislation after legislation after legislation and changing the criteria because that erodes trust between stakeholders. The fragmentation of provisions between healthcare services and local and social services needs to lead to a lack of coordination, which affects those waiting periods and administration procedures that, that uh, was talked about earlier. And finally, gathering and updating evidence and data on sustainability in order to plan for, for funding or in the policy mix of benefits and services is also key. Those are just some thoughts of themes, um, and that uh, ends my short presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rachel, for this uh, presentation. I think this also uh, feeds a little bit into what Dr. Khoury was mentioning about how the importance of including uh, people in uh, you said in the decision making process or or you know in their needs uh, she was talking more about you know there needs to be a way to hear these people out because they have they have a lot to say as well about their uh, experiences um, so I want to I want to dis discuss a little bit the the questions that we have in the Q&A but I also want to touch on a topic maybe that we didn't really go into which is um, you know, is there a structural exclusion of these individuals with these specific needs from these types of coverage systems? And I'm going to really try to focus the discussion there because I feel like, um, in my experience, as someone who works also in policymaking and as a social psychologist, uh, often it's it's a political move, right, to exclude people. And if we look at the variety of uh, populations that are excluded often from these types of services, they are usually also perceived as an economic burden, right? Someone that does not necessarily give back to society. So they are not the ones that are probably going to be paying the taxes that are that is going to be funding the service that's for them. So I want to talk about the political economy behind um, first, the, the perception of, of individuals that have psychological or mental impairments, and also um, how do we also include them in a way that's not stop gapping? Uh, because I feel like, you know, everything that you have detailed, uh, Dr. Rachel, 
is great if you have a state that's actually interested. And you you mentioned this, that you know the official state has to be the one collecting this information based on the need. We, we, we take action. And Dr. Khoury has experience in the Lebanese Psychological Association and the American Psychological Association. And I think she can touch on this a bit more. But I want to see what the link is between this. Is it political? Is there really a reason? Is it too much money? Does it cost too much money to include these people clearly in policymaking? Uh, and uh, the question that goes to Dr. Uh, Ahmed Kitam Bis Alun Bas is a is a healthy suburb CS Manhaj La Staksa or Istabayad Hol al Ashkas Min CS Ishtimaya or CSI. وبحب كمان هون إذا بتحب تزيد شو هو دور ال civil societies أو المجتمع المدني بمساعدة إذا بدنا الأكاديميكس وال والسلطات بتنفيذ هيك نوع عوانين. So Dr. Khoury, Dr. Rachel, would you like to weigh in? Uh, we will leave just one minute for this conversation, just like a back and forth, uh, so that we we move on to the questions in the Q and A. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm very happy to, to jump in there. Thank you so much for that really interesting and uh, poignant question, Carol. So in terms of political economy, yes, of course, there is always uh, a political um, uh, issue here. Uh, if you think about um, really the, the rest of the world in terms of um, what the kind of care that we used to have, which was in residential large uh, institutions that were increasingly where, where everybody put um, all the social ills of society, including people with mental health problems. So we had large Victorian hospitals for many, many years. And uh, one of the reasons why um, the, uh, they were closed down was not only because of scandals, not only because of the uh, 1960s civil rights movement, not only because of a changing philosophy around normalization of those individuals, but also because they were very expensive to run and they had been mismanaged. And so uh, what the government thought was that by moving everybody out of those institutions into the community, they would get more money by selling off the land from those hospitals. That did not happen. But actually, with the cost, uh, all of the cost research um, uh, uh, that's shown is actually that the, the, the community care was, was less expensive than those large hospitals. Mm -hmm. On your point about um, this issue of uh, people not paying taxes, we have found a lot of the research has shown that people with mental health problems and people with intellectual disabilities as well, who will, may also have mental health problems, are some of the best workers. And if you can put in supported employment, and I've, I've been involved in studies of these myself, then some of those employees are the best employees. They always turn up for work. They do very good work. They have insightful. These are people with gifts. These are not people that, are, you know, are, are nothing. They, they have a lot to offer. And I think that this whole kind of paradigm of, you know, their burdens on the state, which is, again, what we talk about in terms of refugees, this demonizing individuals and um, mm -hmm. groups and societies and communities needs to stop. And I yeah. think that it will take time, but that's what has to happen in part and parcel of those laws. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Dr. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forster. I think it's, it's a great segue. Um, and I think maybe a comparison between, you know, more Western aware, um, uh, let's say intellectually aware governments versus our governments who I do not think they think that far in terms of the burden of disease, but rather more on what drives them is more fear and ignorance of what mental illness is. And this, of course, seeps down to to the employers. Um, Carol, you know very well, uh, some employers hesitate to recruit women mm -hmm. uh, because of, you know, the whole uh, getting married, getting pregnant, getting, you know, all this cycle. So let alone mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. have mental, mental um, illnesses. Um, and I think this is why advocacy and awareness is very important. I'm so glad Dr. Forster said that they are they can be the best employees because mm -hmm. the problem is we look at these people as only a mental a mentally ill person, mm -hmm. but actually they have so many other layers that can be so positive and we can benefit from in society. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is that I don't, I mean, I can talk about Lebanon specifically. It cannot be a burden on the government because the government doesn't even cover mental illness. Mm -hmm. So, so that's yeah. not really an issue, really. Yeah. Uh, or covers very, very, very little, really nothing, nothing uh, significant. 
So uh, so you're right that that it's driven about driven from fear. I mean, and COVID during the pandemic, we even if the the data does not say that or it hasn't been researched, but I'm pretty sure every single person understood what an anxiety episode is, whether with with all of the severities that it has. Um, and I think that, and one of the questions in the Q, in the Q and A is that most most articles talk about mental health after COVID nineteen, and um, and they were asking if there are small problems or events on day to day level that could have created all this prevalence of psychosis, stress, uh, impatience, inability to focus, and anxiety. And I mean, I would feel free to to say that. You know, of course, there, there's there's a series of things that have that lead to the manifestation of psychological um, psychological issues or problems, and how did these become exhibited is very much linked to timely events. So the COVID nineteen, the, the the Beirut port explosions are what we call triggers, but it does you know there's a there's a history of this, and when we talk about the MENA region overlooking mental health issue as being a primary issue in, in a war conflict zone in, in, a, in a place filled with corruption, filled with, as Dr. Khoury is saying, a lot of sexism and no women's rights even, um, you know, there it just becomes a bunch of things. Um, they that don't is... think as far. They, mm-hmm. There is fear that, that drives it. And, and as psychologists, we try to remove fear as an incentive to motivate people, right? Because it's not the most... Um, sustainable to say the least. Dr. Rachel? Yes, but that's why you see the model of social support is so important because where you don't have that medical, you know, the, the free health care, okay, yeah. set that aside, you don't have that, but you do have a cacophony, you, you do have a, a social model of very good support, I would say, in Lebanon, better, much better than yeah. uh, in many countries in Europe. I'm thinking about Scandinavia, the Nordic, the, you know, the UK, you have religious groups, you have self-advocacy, advocacy groups, you have all the charities, uh, you know, um, the civil society. I know that sometimes it's criticized that civil society is holding, uh, you know, but but I think it's that bringing the state in yeah. to the, that social model, which is important, uh, as well as informal care and working together. And I, again, I would argue that people can function fairly well with Disability, all kinds of disabilities if they have support to do so. And that Absolutely. is that is exhibited in Lebanon as well. Yeah. We have a lot of people that talk about themselves as being functional depressive people. And and you know, there's uh, there's 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 something heroic now that resonates in actually being able to to push through your psychological challenge or or your mental well-being and you know becoming functional and becoming functional has become a target it's 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 not about becoming better it's about really just being okay being functional um and and this is where i think uh, dr khuri here i want to i want to try to link it up to a question that was uh, asked in the q and a when you were talking about stigma and the false belief and um and someone asked if you think there is a false belief uh, regarding psychotropics and medication so here we're talking about um we're talking about uh, and uh, mood stabilizers uh, antipsychotic medications sometimes even if we're looking at drugs in this case we have caffeine nicotine all of this, uh, is there a false belief regarding these? And I would add, has that changed since COVID and since the economic collapse in Lebanon? Because I think the economic collapse here plays a really important role. And uh, someone asked around, uh, I think this question is for all, does a mentally ill person have to share, uh, in quotations, ill, to share his or her uh, med- uh, condition when they apply for work? I will leave it up to you to the, to answer or I will answer after. But Dr. Khoury, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I mean, there are so many exciting points to talk about, but I just want to uh, absolutely emphasize what Dr. Forster said about the social support. I think the social support in Lebanon is what's keeping this country together, yeah. really. Uh, and absolutely, in the absence of government, everybody else comes in to try to help and be there and support. Um, now, in terms of the um, medication, yes, there, there is definitely a lot of stigma associated with it. There's a lot of misbelief and myths that, you know, people who take medications are actually crazy, they're ill, uh, medications will zone them out, they cannot function. 
But of course, that's not true. There is a role for everything. There is a role for medications when needed. There's a role for therapy when needed. There's a role, you know, for the family and the social support when needed. So they can all come together beautifully. And research has shown that in many, many conditions, medication and therapy combined give the best results and the fastest results. And people do not have to be on medications their whole life. That's also one of the myths. Yeah. So uh, again, educating about that is very important. And, and I always encourage people, please ask your psychiatrist questions. Do not wait until you leave at the door and then ask the secretary, you know, ask them, it's your right, it's your hour, it's your money, please. And if you're not convinced, and I always say, nobody can force you into any treatment. This is your right. So, so in that now to go back to, you know, the pre-COVID and the, I mean, psychiatric problems have always existed, right? And there are always, there have always been risk factors that we know of. There were genetic, there are genetic risk factors, there are environmental ones, exactly. there are biological ones. And this is the model, you know, they all come together and sometimes they need one stressor and everything appears. So that's usually the most common explanation of everything that, ha that you know, that happened pre-COVID and still is happening, of course. Now in, in Lebanon, COVID came and then the collapse and the blast. And I mean, it's well, one thing after another. So I always say to people, you know, we have a very normal reaction to a very abnormal situation. So being stressed and being anxious and being down is okay. Yeah. But there's a very big difference between feeling down, feeling upset, feeling anxious and having a mental illness. There's a very big gap between this and that. Mm -hmm. So react, of course, we're going to react anxiously and feel down when something so big happens like the Beirut blast. But I can tell you, when we feel, for those who, people who felt this initially, very, 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 very few now are diagnosed with depression or generalized anxiety or seeking treatment. So it's okay to have a, a reaction and to feel bad sometimes, but that doesn't mean they're mentally ill. So there's mm -hmm. a difference. Of course, that doesn't mean they cannot seek help. Of course, they can seek help and seek support. So this is kind of what I yeah. wanted to. Is there anything else I missed, Carol? I'm, I don't no, know. No, no. I think I okay. think I think it's the need for. I mean, in policy making, we have to classify things to be able to justify the money that we are going to pay for this strategy or vision that we have. And so I think there's also this. Um, you know, in stigma, it's it's mainly based on false classifications, and a lot of times, and sometimes, um, having having an acute anxiety episode and requiring medication for that, uh, people often mistake that and self-diagnose as uh, someone with generalized anxiety disorder because this is just how the human mind works. We compartmentalize. We need to compartmentalize to make sense out of smaller bits of information because it's just easier to do that. So I think sometimes, again, we go back to the aspect of fear is the driving motivator here. Um, if we are afraid of the stigma associated with medication use, we will normalize using psychotropic medication. This is really historically how it has worked in Lebanon. Um, uh, and I think the why, why I asked about pre post COVID is because the economic collapse that came paired with it had to bring out or force people to come out and say, we need our antipsychotic medications. Uh, we had a, um, a breaches of confidentiality with, with patients having to run around with their um, uh, prescription medication, trying to get their dose of antidepressants. And so I'm wondering here, and with I was wondering here with regards to the question that was asked, I think the stigma around psychotropic medication is still there in Lebanon. I think it has become a little bit more in the medical field. So, um, and, and I, you do hear people saying, at least they're getting help for it, right? And, you know, people hoping that it's not going to be for a long time and that they can just finish the cycle and and bounce back. Um, uh, someone asked if a mentally, uh, if a person with mental or psychological uh, uh, disorders or difficulties has to share his or her or their working condition, uh, sorry, their condition when they are applying for work. Uh, I don't think that this is necessary in most cases, if not all of them. I do know that in some international um, organizations that I have applied to maybe that offer healthcare coverage and mental health services, they ask ask about a pre-existing condition, but I will leave it up to Dr. Khoury. I think you would know 
much more on this. Uh, I don't think, yeah. I mean, no, absolutely. Ahead. They no, do no, not no. need to, to, to convey that at all. This is something yeah. very personal. And actually, if it happens that they do and they are refused work based on that, they, that is pure discrimination, discrimination yeah, against exactly. you know mentally ill people. So that that's an even bigger problem. Yeah. So no, they do not have to disclose at all, not in any yeah. any way. Absolutely not. Yeah, I do know that some organizations that offer services, uh, free services for mental health for their staff, they do ask if you if you have that need to begin with. But that is not uh, in bad faith. That's more of uh, you know, just the documenting so that you can you can have access to the treatments that you might need. Yeah, and that would be part of the medical checkup. And that's usually it's, you yeah. know, doctors who are, again, prone to confidentiality who would get this information. It Absolutely. would not seep Absolutely. into a decision of employment. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Badakmano? Okay, I think that the mental health and the physical health is a part of the mental health and the physical health. نعم باعتبارها حقا مؤسسا لإمكانية التمتع بباقي الحقوق الكونية نعم. وبالتالي على الدول أن لا تحسب الخسارة أو الخسارة المادية التي يمكن أن تصرفها على الصحة النفسية والعقلية بقدر ما يجب أن تحسب الخسارة التي يتلقاها المجتمع من تهميش وإقصاء الأشخاص الذين في وضعية إعاقة نفسية وعقلية هذا جانب والجانب الثاني بس تفتح الفيديو بس دكتور أحمد معليش أوكي عفوا مع ديرة شكرا نعم تفضل كمل أوكي قلت بأنه أيضا أن النهوض بالصحة النفسية والعقلية في بلداننا رهين بمراجعة السياسات العمومية الموجهة من أجل بناء وهندسة سياسة ترابية بالمدن بالبوادي مم. في القرى وتوفير الخدمات العلاجية بما يضمن الكرامة الإنسانية للمرضى وحقوقهم الأساسية من خلال أولا بشكل دقيق أوضح توفير بنيات استقبال في المستوى المطلوب سد الخصاص المريع في الموارد البشرية تبني سياسة علاجية متعددة الأبعاد إعادة النظر في أتمنة بعض الأدوية وإقرار المجانية الكاملة للمرضى ضمان المساواة في العلاج ما بين جميع المواطنات والمواطنين وهذا كله متوقف على ضرورة تقييم أو تشخيص الوضع من خلال إجراء الأبحاث وتشجيع العلم في هذا المجال والتخلي على الأفكار يعني السلبية تجاه الإعاقة النفسية التي تصنفهم دائما في خانة الطابوهات ورصد الميزانية الكافية لذلك شكرا تمام شكرا كثير دكتور أحمد سو ما بعرف إذا يا دكتور ريتشو yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Berkia here and, and uh, Dr. Kudri. And I, I would just um, say that I really don't think that the government should be let off uh, in this respect, really, because uh, the government uh, uh, have, uh, all Arab governments have, um, have actually signed up to the ICESCR. Yeah. And that is a treaty, it's a signed, in, it's in law. And as part of the, these legal treaties and declarations is to make a plan. So there yeah. has to be a plan. And so I think this should be coming back, going back to the government and saying, where is the plan for mental health services? I would yeah. also say that some of the work that we're doing at the moment, I have a colleague who's on the call now, uh, Marla Rongro from um, Jordan. We're, we're, we're using the policy lab method to bring mm -hmm. um, ministries and, and uh, civil society groups and other stakeholders together to talk about this in a kind of a, a, a more maybe a safe space so that they don't feel uh, that they're being got at mm -hmm. uh, but but in, in, in an inclusive way and maybe that's 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 hopefully will help in this regard but i don't yeah. think i don't think any country should be resigned um to yeah. not having universalism i mean i don't think uh, this that applies necessarily to lebanon i think there's a there's a there's a, um, a calculated push and pull on the topic because uh, there was a youth mental health national mental health uh, uh, policy paper draft i think in 2012 
uh, Dr. Khoury or there is there is there is million. the national mental health program actually there which is, is part yeah. of the Ministry of Health which exactly. laid down a strategy and is very very active and I think yeah. they played a very big role actually in putting the mental health on the forefront absolutely but there's also so much to do <laughs> so much to do and and, and the, it was slow though like I remember um, there were there was a lot of backlash or pushback yeah. at least on it uh, it was very challenging and the funding, interestingly things. enough, and never came from the government. No, the funding always came from outside governments or NGOs or, yeah. you know, private donors. Yeah. Private donors. Um, and, and that was also in collaboration heavily with uh, civil society actors yeah. working on uh, I'll tell you on the on the on the margins of mental health. So I remember that Schoon, the addiction center, was part of that program. You have SIDC, which is also an addiction center, and you know people that offer sexual health services. So on the margin, in parallel, we're trying to intersect with mm -hmm. mental health. We're trying to show again, classify how we can be inclusive of this particular component in our strategies and in our development plans. <coughs> Um, and and, um, and I think that's and I, okay. And I think that you're doing tremendous work, actually, um, particularly yeah. in Lebanon, but also across the Arab world. And I think that, again, I would reiterate that in the UK, for example, and across Europe, it took yeah. from the 18th, from the, the, 18th, the century. 18th century, right yeah. up until the 1960s. And then again, and if you if I could list you the, the amount of laws that yeah. we've had, and that's what I would urge you not to go through, to have law after law yeah. after law after law. But we will one, skip. We will skip. You skip all that. Sure, skip all that. Probably. We will, <laughs> skip all the we mistakes. Will, <laughs> we'll be very honest. We have a we have a knack for doing things that that cannot be done. Uh, we yeah. will skip them for sure. And okay. and I think this is the this is where the the overall question that I want to maybe close on or maybe open open a discussion for later, which is, can we call it social protection if it's not funded by the state? I mean, NGOs cannot offer social protection floor. We can keep doing the work that we do, but eventually if the funding now moves to somewhere else, and and this is this is also as answering someone who asked you know do you think this interest in mental health uh, starting from 2019 came because of awareness about the subject or, or were there other reasons I also think that because there was an increased need about it you know people that have investment and money to invest became more aware about it but NGOs and civil society groups and and volunteer groups cannot bear the brunt of the work of the effort that should be done by the state. One, for capacity reasons, this is not sustainable. Two, it does not have access to the sufficient amount of data required to create something so national and large scale, at least in a way that offers um, a, a division of services in a way. Uh, so, so how, Yane, I think I think there, there's more work to be done. Uh, and I think uh, uh, a lot more data has to be has to be gathered. But if we are to end it on one one note, if there's one step to do now, um, one step that you think should be done now, today, tomorrow, to make us a little bit closer to being more inclusive and more universal with our social protection on mental health. Awareness and advocacy for me, I would say Awareness that's, that's yeah, absolutely. That that's the first step. That's that's the step that actually can spread the most. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, even if you make a difference with ten out of a hundred, that's already ten that's uh, that are on your side that will speak. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. دكتور أحمد عم بسأل إذا إذا في عنا توصية واحدة خطوة واحدة ممكن نخدها نتخذها هلا لأن نقرب أكثر لهدفنا بأنه نكون شموليين أكثر بتغطيتنا ل لأشخاص ل ل بالفئة المستهدفة اللي عم نحكي عنها شو بتكون هي هيدا الخطوة؟ أو دكتور راشيل if you're ready you can go ahead Sorry, were you asking me? Yeah, if you if you have oh, an sure. answer. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 sure. I would say, answer. well, I would say, um, coming from a, a you know a qualified barrister, I would say uh, an open dialogue with government, uh, mm -hmm. that and um, convincing them that actually it's much better for the economy if you have yeah. if you put in those supports and that you yeah. can show from data that the economies uh, that 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 do very well. And I point to Sweden in particular, Nordic countries. Their mm -hmm. economy is good. Why? Because they put in those supports. And they put in and cash 
spent now is cash saved later. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Ahmed, have you got anything to add to the end of the conversation? Dr. Ahmed? Okay. ما ما بعتقد عم بيسمعنا طيب انا بعتقد اذا ما في حدا ما في حدا عنده دكتور احمد رجعت اوكي اه عفوا في حدا بس بعد حدا بعد شيء ثاني بس اوكي في حدا عم يسال انه لابد من اجل بناء منظومه متكامله لدى اي دوله عربيه من الاعتراف بالتقصير والعمل بشكل مؤسساتي لايجاد المراكز ذات الصله في المجتمع وبدعمها ماديا وتربيه الجيل العربي على احترام مشاعر ذوي الاعاقه ربما بمثالك تنجح الحكومات في ردم الفجوه في هذا المجال الحديث اه عفوا فما هي ما ما كثير فهمت السؤال ما بعرف اذا فرح اذا ما بعرف اذا بفتكر بفتكر يلي يلي انا فهمته كارول انه عم يحكي اللي ايش نحن حكيناها انه بدون ايه وجود عم على على بدون المؤسسات ما راح يكون في دعم كافي لذوي الحاجات وهلا ما هي خططكم خلص رح نحل المشكله نحن هلا صح انحلت صح تمام <تصفيق> بس بفتكر يعني يكون في ندوات من هال بهالاطار و و و واحاديث عم عم تنحكى بهالمجال بفتكر هيدي بدايه الخطوه yeah. يعني صح اي اجري اوكي انا بعتقد اذا ما بقى في اسئله فينا نختم الجلسه نجزه ابكر uh, بعتقد uh, تم تم التجاوب uh, sorry uh, I think we we have answered all of the uh, questions that we have uh, we had we had posed uh, I really hope that this starts off the conversation and the, the work practically uh, for the future uh, I would like to also thank uh, Farah Al Shami who's the lead on the uh, the uh, the Aris regional project on social protection. Uh, we have her to thank and Andrew and Saria and Naida for all this, uh, putting this all together and working through all the technical difficulties that we might have had today. Um, I would like to thank the panelists for your participation and your really valuable input. Uh, I hope this was a fruitful conversation. And if no one else has anything else to add, I would like to conclude the 10th webinar in the social protection program that we have. Thank, thank you, you, Carol. Carol. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Goodbye. Shukran. Shukran, Dr. Ahmed. Shukran. <laughs> bye, Farah. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it, Carol. It's very nice to meet you. I did. I, I was very nice to meet you too, as well. Really, yeah. really useful information from Yeah, very. I learned a lot as well. So that was good. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. So, Cheers. Bye bye. Where are you working, by the way? You're actually working for the Arab um, before. Uh, no, I mean, listen, let's move this conversation privately. Uh, oh, yeah, let's go offline so... because we're still live streaming. Yeah.